Good morning, River Life. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Hey, we're so glad you've joined us. Hopefully you're getting settled in, maybe getting out of bed, maybe not, grabbing some breakfast, uh, but we're hoping you're having a good morning so far, and if not, we genuinely hope that we can help make your morning a little better. So, happy summer! It is amazing. The weather's turning. It's it's getting muggier. Yep, and, and the sun's out, and a nice spot in the shade is feeling really good. The mosquitoes are out. Um, but I know I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Our pool is almost ready to swim in, and mm-hmm. so we're, I'm going to be cooling off in the pool, floating on a float with a fruity, icy drink in my hand, and it'll be it'll be pretty good. Yes, and we're excited that summer is here. Uh, Fourth of July is next weekend. Can you believe that? I know. Fourth of July, that's crazy. June is come and almost Mm -hmm. gone. Yeah. Yeah. So with summer, we've got a couple things happening here. So first is uh, we're going to be doing a little shorter services this summer. uh, Because we know that there are all kinds of things that happen and things you want to do, little trips and and family stuff and all of that. So service will be a little shorter over the next couple months. Also, we wanted to let you know that we are not gonna be having service next Sunday. So that's July 4th weekend, no service. Uh, So spend some time with family, um, celebrate freedom, uh, light some fireworks in a safe manner, of course, and be social distant and wear your mask. Uh, So with that, even, even though we're having a shorter service, don't worry. We are not going to be cutting our cutest and silliest segment that you see every Sunday, and that is, what are Chip and Pebbles wearing today? So, Pebble, what are Chip and Pebbles wearing today? Well, in honor of our Independence Day coming next weekend, we will be decking up in Dun- Fourth July. Yeah, they are not amused. Once again, <laughs> there we go. So, hey, Chip and Pebbles right. are all for the Stars and Stripes this weekend. Woo! <laughs> Thank you. They they have no choice. They have to do this with us every week. And so, <laughs> there we go. Um, hey, with that, we have been doing online service now for four months. That's crazy. And and if you've been following, if you, if you watch us most Sundays, then you've probably figured out what type of online church viewer you are. If not, here's a video to help you figure that out. Old Testament, the new New Testament. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's a... okay. Did they say it was on MySpace or Twitter? Maybe it was Bookface. All right. So I'm watching on Facebook and streaming on YouTube forward this to my uncle and email this to my sister. <laughs> Easy. Mom, I gotta call you back. Yeah, Pastor Joel preaching this weekend. I gotta go. Alright, bye. Amen. Amen. I can't see a thing. I think it's too small. Amen. Oh, amen. I didn't know to take notes on that. Okay, mommy's gonna sit down for church. You stay right here, okay? All right. So what kind of online church viewer are you? I bet one of those matched how you watch us on Sunday mornings. Um, I know for me, if I weren't in front of the camera, I would totally be in bed, the one watching like on my phone or maybe my tablet and groggily staring at the screen. Uh, Well, hey, no matter what type of online viewer you are, we all can enjoy some worship. So here's a little bit. Here's one from our throwback days when we were back in the building. Enjoy.
get back in there again one day. Just hang tight everyone and be safe. Well, next up, I've got a great video from the Village Church. That's Matt Chandler's church. And this one is for all you parents and aunties and uncles. This one is how do you talk to your kids about racism? And I, I, I love the idea that this one approaches um, because it is biblical, 
but it's also really honest and genuine. And so your kids are wondering, and here's a great opportunity. Here's a great way to have a conversation with your kids about racism. I have the joy of being in an interracial marriage. And so for me, my kids, they've always noticed that mommy and daddy looked different. And as they started to grow up, they started to be exposed to our history in our nation. So they they would ask, I remember um, when they learned about the Jim Crow era, separate but equal. And my son asked, mommy, I can't, imagine anyone being mean to you and at that moment I realized they are starting to understand that people hate people based on merely the color of their skin or people hate people based merely on their culture racism exists and so I don't want to um, let the culture teach my kids about racism I want them to understand that we live in a fallen world, that we have all sinned. Every single one of us has sinned against God. And one of the ways that our sin is manifested is the way we treat one another. And one of the ways that we can harm each other is through hating and having pride over another person merely because of the color of their skin. Racism exists, and I think even in those those I, I, simple words, just letting our kids understand that Genesis speaks of a time when there was per perfection, and then when sin came into the world, one of the things that happened is that we began to treat each other, um, not just poorly, but with hate and divide. And so that is how I teach the kids is just to make sure that they understand what sin is and that helps to teach what racism is. Now let's throw it over to Kong for our weekly scripture reading and read along prayer. Our genuine hope is that that this segment that we do each week helps you get into God's word and even gives you a chance to pray and helps you with some words to pray. So here's Kong continuing on our themes of uh, social justice and grace and mercy. Hey, River Life Church, it's Kong, the associate pastor. We're going to go into our scripture reading and prayer time for service today. And in these last few weeks, we've taken time to read passages on laments and passages on justice as we reflect on the condition of our world in light of Racism and Social Injustices. Today we're going to be reading from Isaiah chapter 58 verses 6 through 12 and I'll be reading from the NIV. The passage is going to be put on screen and so I'm going to invite you to read along with me or you can also meditate and listen to the words that are being read as we respond to what God is calling us to do in light of racism and social injustices and just the brokenness that we see and so this is what isaiah 58 verses 6 through 12 says is not this the kind of fasting i have chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke to set the oppressed free and break every yoke is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter, when you see the naked to clothe them, and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. 
He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. Our prayer today is taken from Sojourners, a ministry who seek to discover the intersection of faith, politics, and culture. And our prayer today focuses and reflects on the passage that we just read. And so would you pray this prayer with me? May we, by the power of your Spirit, truly fast as you desire, loosing the bonds of injustice, letting the oppressed go free, and breaking every yoke, sharing our bread with the hungry, bringing the homeless poor into our houses, covering the naked, and satisfying the needs of the afflicted. Let it be for the sake of your kingdom. Amen. This is a red balloon. It's true, it's red, we all know our colors. The absolute truth is that this balloon is red. No, it's not. That's green. What? This right here is a green balloon. That is the prettiest yellow balloon. <laughs> yellow? Th this is red. Yeah, come over here. No, it's green. It's red! Yeah, I know, it's a red balloon. <laughs> hey, will you look at it from my point of view, please? What? Hey, nice blue balloon. <gasps> it's blue. green! Green? It's red. What? Why are you saying it's red when it's blue, huh? It's totally purple from here! Purple? Okay, you know what? Let's just settle this once and for all, okay? Where are you going? Hey, what color is this balloon? I only see in black and white. Okay. Hey, Mark, what color... There is no balloon. This is ridiculous! Hey, I know what the problem is. Look, um, my mom taught me that this was blue. But, um, you know, then she said this is red and green, yellow, you know, and on and on. <laughs> okay, I get that your mom taught you that that was blue, but I mean, that's not the truth. Whoa, why are you talking bad about his mom? Yeah. I'm not. Listen, I respect your mother. Thank you. And the way she raised you. She taught you that it was blue. Our moms taught us that it was red. Right. That's the way it goes. I thought you oh. said it was green. It is green. See, I'm smart. I went to college. And in college, I learned all these different <laughs> theories about color. Really? And my color professors who have doctorates in color do you have a doctorate in color? Uh, no. It shows. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> they can't even agree on one theory of color, so you have to look at all the different theories and pick which one works best for you. And green is great for me. That makes sense. Thank you. No, you can't just pick whatever color fits your life the best. Red is red. Okay, do you know the word intolerant? Yeah. Because that's what you're being right now. <laughs> all right, you're shoving your opinion down my throat. Okay, it's not my opinion, it's the truth. <laughs> hold on, hold on. All we're saying is that we need to stop arguing about trivial things like truth. You know, the funny thing about truth is, it's true, whether you believe it or not. So, Christians have a problem with truth. Now, this is a very strange thing to say about a group of people who follow a guy who actually said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But Christians have a problem with truth. See, here are just a few examples of it. Did you know that Christians can be found among, um, in large groups among flat earthers, anti-vaxxers, climate change deniers, Obama birthers, anti-maskers, and coronavirus 5Gers? Uh, when the Russians wanted to influence the 2016 election, with some Facebook ads, do you know one of the groups that was heavily targeted was Christians. Why? Because they knew that Christians could be easily manipulated. And even most recently, the sharing of the pandemic video. It was rampant among Christian circles. I can confirm this because a bunch of you shared it on your own walls. You see, Christians over the last 20 years, have become strangely attracted to conspiracy theories. Now, how did this all happen? 
Well, let's start with the premise that scripture calls us to be wise and discerning. So Proverbs, as we've seen in the last few weeks, Proverbs is full of commands to live by biblical wisdom and, and contrasted it by living by foolishness. Jesus said to his disciples, I am sending you out like, like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. The Apostle Paul said, be very careful how you live then, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Now notice a similarity between all of these ideas, all of these verses. See, there's a reason to be wise. There are fools around you. You're among wolves and the days are evil. See, that's why it's perfectly understandable to be skeptical of the government or the mainstream media. Because the truth is they rarely have a godly kingdom mindset to their work. However, this mistrust too often leads believers to become more gullible, not more discerning. Let me say that again. This mistrust too often leads believers to become more gullible, not more discerning. And listen, folks, gullibility is not a spiritual gift. So why are Christians so susceptible to believing in hoaxes, half-truths, and even easily provable lies? Well, here are some characteristics that make you, if you're a believer, more likely to believe in conspiracy theories. Um, one, you feel like Christians are persecuted or under attack. Two, you believe there's a culture war going on against Christian values here in America. Three, you're very rigid in your beliefs. Four, you see politics as polarized, us versus them. Five, you demonize anyone who believes differently than you. Six, you only follow a few news sources that align with your own personal beliefs. And seven, your social media is filled with people like you, so you only see posts that reinforce your beliefs. All of those are characteristics that make you more susceptible to falling for hoaxes, half-truths, and lies. So the more that those describe you, the more susceptible you are. Why? Because a lot of conspiracy theories play directly into these beliefs. See, that's, that's what the Russian bots did on Facebook in 2016. They carefully crafted posts and graphics to trigger fears among Christians about these seven beliefs. And hundreds of thousands of believers fell for it. So how can believers be better? How can we follow God's call to wisdom and become more discerning and not more gullible? Well, the Bible's answer to this is to exchange truths for lies. So according to Psychology Today, an article on the website, uh, researchers have found three primary reasons or categories of reasons why people believe in conspiracy theories. First, our desire for understanding and certainty. Second, our desire for control and security. Third, our desire to maintain a positive self-image. And now for each one of these, I'm going to give you a few biblical truths. And the more you believe, the more you internalize these biblical truths, the less likely you'll be to fall for a lie. So let's start with the first one. People believe conspiracy theories because of our desire for understanding and certainty. See, we don't like unknowns. So we desperately want answers to our questions and not even necessarily true answers. 
but rather answers that comfort us or fit into our worldview. So what does the Bible say to this? James 1.5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, not Facebook and definitely not InfoWars. You should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Or Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, for the believer, truth is not a proposition. It's a person. And that person is Jesus. So if you're seeking truth more than Jesus, you're getting it wrong. So that's the first one. Second, Second, people believe conspiracy theories because of our desire for control and security. See, people need to feel they're in control of their lives. And conspiracy theories give, give their believers, their followers, a sense of control and security. See, this is especially true when the alternative count or the opposing side feels threatening. So what does the Bible say to this? Well, in Isaiah 55, 8 to 9, God says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth's, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. See, you don't need to be in control because God is. God is so much bigger than anything that we are. That's why we can trust him to be the one in control. Or in Deuteronomy 31, Moses tells his apprentice, his protege Joshua, this. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. If you want security, if you feel like your world is falling apart, if you want security, God will never leave you nor forsake you. Our ultimate security comes from knowing and believing God. So third, People believe conspiracy theories because of our desire to maintain a positive self-image. Now, what does that mean? Well, research shows that people who feel insecure or socially marginalized are more likely to believe in conspiracy theories. This is because it gives them a sense of importance that they are the holder of privileged information. But see, you don't need secret knowledge of government conspiracies to be special. If you're a believer, you are a child of God and you are special. God calls you his beloved. You are complete in him. In Christ, you are saved, forgiven, redeemed. You are loved, chosen, adopted into royalty. You are free from sin, death, and condemnation. You belong to God. The more you learn to place your hope and self-worth in God through Christ, the less appealing secret conspiracy theories will be. So I want to close with this sobering warning from Jesus out of Matthew 12. Verses 36 and 37 say this. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for er every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So think about that next time you post to Facebook. Think about that next time you talk to somebody. God has a call, a high calling for us. So I leave you with this. Speak wisely, especially of other people. Research posts before you share them. Never troll. 
It's immature and it's unchristian. Love your enemies. Never slander them. Don't turn people into props for your ideology. And lean into Jesus and the love of God. In essence, be people of the truth. Truth. In the history of the world, nothing has had more power than truth. It's the cause of wars, the goal of revolutions. With truth comes understanding, and with understanding comes freedom. Often we treat truth like we treat money. We possess it, hoard it, and stow it away, using it for control over those without it. But God has entrusted us with the truth so that we could steward it, so that we could rightly handle it. In 2 Timothy 2.15, the Apostle Paul writes, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. The word for rightly handling in this verse is orthotomeo, which means to carve a clear path, to make the way straight. It calls to mind the ministry of John the Baptist, the voice that cried in the wilderness, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. John the Baptist models what it means to be a wise steward of truth, to handle the truth rightly, to clear the way for the revelation of God. And it was Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is God's truth, the truth. We are not. We do not possess the truth any more than we possess Jesus. The truth is living and active. It comes to life in us and through us. And when we rightly handle the truth, it flows through us to others. We create a clear path for God to reach the world through us. John understood this well, that unlike money, truth isn't a limited resource to hold on to. The more we handle it rightly, the more it multiplies in the world. So what does that mean for us? If the truth is alive, planted within us and coming to maturity, it means receiving the truth that is planted within you with humility and meekness, letting it transform you from the inside out and then putting aside our own preferences and prejudices to let the one who is the truth speak the truth. Being a good steward means announcing the arrival of the king, decreasing so the king can increase, bearing witness to the gift that God has given humankind through your words and your deeds. So receive truth, be transformed by it, and clear a path for it to others. Show the world the person who is the truth, the person who is full of grace and truth. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The truth lives within you. It has set you free. And now you can set it free. Let the truth speak through you to the world. That is how we rightly handle the truth. So we'd like to close our time today by spending together uh, time as a family to pray together for especially those of you who have COVID, uh, whether in your own families, your friends, uh, people that you know. Um, in the last couple of weeks, we've been hearing of more and more cases and more and more that are in the River Life family even. Mm -hmm. So we're going to pray for all of you and uh, we may not say your name because you may not have given us permission to, but you know who you are. And those of you who are praying with us, you probably have uh, people that you know. So say their names in your prayers as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, join me as we pray as a family and lift our needs to God. Father, we come before you and we want to acknowledge that as your children, you have called us and asked us, to come and uh, petition. You have commanded that if we have anything on our hearts, that we can lay them at your feet. And so, Lord, here we are. We come with empty hands. 
Uh, we are desperate for you, Lord. We, as a family, cry out to you to say that we need you, God. Um, there is currently no cure for the coronavirus. Uh, there's no vaccine. Um, all the doctors can do is provide some care and provide help with breathing if people need it. But beyond that, Lord, there's nothing they can do. And so, Lord, we are desperate. And it's not that we just come to you when we're desperate, but it is especially that we come together when we are desperate. So, Father, we lift up our dear loved ones, yes, God. our families, our uh, brothers and sisters, um, children in our congregation, friends that we have, co-workers. Lord, we know people who have contracted the virus and we are concerned for them. We, we petition for you to bring healing upon them. Lord, we ask that your mighty hand would protect them and that those who have the virus, that it would just run its course and be done and that they would be healed. Lord, we ask that you would provide all that they need uh, by way of uh, medical services, by way of comfort. Uh, Lord, we also know that for some who are in the hospital right now, that they are cut off from family and friends. They are by themselves. And so, Lord, we ask for your presence in those ICU rooms, in those hospital rooms. Lord, we pray that your presence is with them. And Father, for those who are sick and are at home and quarantining, Lord, we pray that you would uh, be with them as well and that you would uphold their physical bodies and that you would uh, be with them to comfort them and to to bring them the just the presence of someone there who is you, Lord. And Father, we ask that we would all be responsible and do our part to uh, protect ourselves, but also to protect those that we love. And so, Father, I pray for for everyone. You know exactly who they are. You know what they're dealing with. You know not only physically what they're going through, but emotionally and spiritually. And so, Lord, we lift them to you. And we pray for the practical needs as well, the financial uh, resources that uh, our family and friends need to get through these medical um, issues and to be able to uh, still be sustained in their everyday living, Lord. So we ask for your financial provisions as well. And Father, I pray that you would move us as a River Life family to reach out and care for those who are uh, in pain, who are hurting, um, that we would have sensitive ears, that our hearts would be soft, and that we would be uh, moved by your Holy Spirit to care and love uh, those who are in need. And so, Father, again, we say that you are our sovereign Lord. You are able to do more than we ask, more than we can imagine. So we pray for all that you can and you will do uh, for your people. And we, we thank you. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Amen. Well, everyone know that if you're being affected by COVID, we are praying for you and our prayer team is praying for you and our ministry team is praying that we are lifting you up and we believe in a healing God. We, be we believe in a miraculous God uh, and a faithful God. So so continue, persevere, have faith and, and we will continue praying for you. Uh, so with that, we're going to wrap up. Just to remind you, no service next week. So don't worry about that. Um, and and then we're going to kick off again the following week with, with a new series. So with that, let me send you off with a blessing. So open up your hands. Uh, open up. Get ready to receive a blessing. I'll extend a hand of blessing. This is God's heart for you as you follow and obey him. May the Lord bless you 
and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Go on God's grace. Be safe. We love you, everyone, and have a great day.